and welcome to Bald Leadership. I'm Colin Pular, and along with my co-host, Kavis Reed, we explore a whole range of issues related to leadership. Today's guest is Mr. Jeffrey Orge, former commissioner of the Canadian Football League and current CEO of TVO. With his sports media background, he was a person responsible for assembling the dream team of NBA greats for the 92 Olympics. Jeffrey shares his journey, life lessons, and the need to do something for purpose, on purpose. Leadership is about accountability. It's about accountability. You need to be accountable to yourself. You need to be accountable to other people. You need to own it. Okay, whatever it is, whatever it is, you need to own it. But it, you know, I think the bottom line is for younger people, do not be deterred. Do not give up. Own your failure too. You know, it's it, sometimes you go through an imposter syndrome. Am I good enough? Because maybe I didn't hit it out of the park the first time, or I didn't get 100%, or I only scored 50% of my goal. That's okay because it's not about focusing on the failure, it's about focusing on the lesson learned from the failure and taking ownership of, of, of whatever the result is and just moving forward. But that's leadership, taking ownership, being accountable. Relationships matter, we talked about that earlier. You know, am I, am I willing to invest in other people and forging those relationships? So enjoy along with us, every guest and every conversation we have. Laugh a little bit, and don't worry, you don't have to be bald to enjoy it. How are you, Mr. <laughs> Commissioner? I'm fine, thank you, sir. <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> I haven't been called that since uh, I don't know yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you, I'm never, I'm never going to stop calling you that. <laughs> but is it, it, you know, someone told so my cousin um, David Patterson was the governor of New York State for a while, and and people still refer to him as governor, Governor Patterson, and he once told me that once you're a president or once you're a governor, that's that title always stays with you. But no one ever said that about commissioner of anything. So president and governor, I guess, but uh, but certainly not commissioner. But that's okay. I'm, I'm okay without that. Yeah. <laughs> Davis, before before you got on, uh, Jeffrey and I were uh, we spent a lot of time talking about you. Man. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> sure did. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> No. That's okay. We just we just ran out of time, but yeah. Colin and I will resume. When well, you yeah. Off, so yeah. don't worry about now it. Now you guys need so counseling. More to you say. Now you need counseling. <laughs> Jeez. No. So I, I I gotta uh okay, I gotta I gotta tell you a story. This actually happened to me this morning. Uh uh. Uh I thought I thought I made a big bag of money this morning. But my honesty <laughs> didn't allow that to happen. So <laughs> No, no, no word of a lie. Um, I, I, I drove, I drove somewhere. I don't know if I should tell exactly where, because, <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't the pot shop. Like, <laughs> you, you that. didn't go to get cookies and tea again. <laughs> no, I didn't get. No, I didn't get cookies or brownies or anything like that. Uh, so no, no, I, I, I'd actually. Um, I went in a little bit later. Went to, uh, went to the gym I work out at, and so there weren't a lot of people when I got there except the owner, but I pulled up in the parking lot and, uh, and, you know, she's got some pretty good, pretty good clients. You know, I would say, you know, upper level clients. So I pull up and I, I, I back into a spot and, and it's, it's been raining. And so there's, there's like gravel and sand and dirt all over the ground and stuff. And, and I, I grab my bag out of the car and I look down and there's something shiny on the ground. I was like, what is that? It's kind of in the mud. So I've been, been I picked this thing up and it's all covered in mud. And, and it, I thought it was a fake ring. Like I thought it was costume jewelry because it had some big old diamonds on there. <laughs> I was like, this thing's fake. <laughs> like, so it, it, it was like, I had this big one in the center, then like, two big ones on either side. And then it got kind of small. I said, this is, uh, this can't be real. 
Like, who would just throw this out here in the middle of an industrial park and just... <laughs> so, uh, so I walk in with this thing and I wash it off and I look at it and say, no, this, this is real, man. This is real. Ooh. So, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, I go up, hey, Jamie, somebody missed a race. She goes, yeah, I got this client, this new client last night. And uh, she she's called, she, she went to leave, she lost her ring, she thought she took it off in the building, blah, 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 blah. They've searched everywhere. They've had people going up and down looking. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's a fairly costly ring. I won't get into how much it's worth, but it, it's a fairly costly ring. And I'm like, man, then the guilt <laughs> thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> and, and the worst part is she's not going to give you a finder's fee. <laughs> no, 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 it ain't nothing in it for me. I'm like, like an honest gentleman, I pull out this beautiful ring I, that I just cleanly, I just washed, I just cleaned off real nice. <laughs> it wasn't the guilt that hit you, it was the intent yeah, that, <laughs> that welled up. There we go. Broad your shoulder. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It is integrity. It's my integrity, it was my integrity. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> when she pulls up in that 500 Mercedes, takes up yeah. her <laughs> you know, How do you make all that money, Colin? How do you get them nice cars? I know what you're doing. You're in the diamond business. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I know you guys probably have more stories uh, to tell about my faux pas, so I'll just leave you guys alone and let, let you. <laughs> you know, uh, Jeffrey, um, Cavis, and I try to record once every week, every, once every couple weeks, and every time we have a stupid story that happened, man, like <laughs> something <laughs> dumb. <laughs> Something dumb that just happened. That's the story of our lives, right? <laughs> yeah. And I could have made some good I could have made some good money. <laughs> and we, that thing would have been hawked so quick. <laughs> you have to fence it in Calgary, the city I'm not allowed to go to anymore. <laughs> Anyhow. Right, right. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Bald Leadership. Uh, I'm Colin Pular, along with my co-host, Kavis Reed, and today we have Commissioner Jeffrey Orridge, if we could still call you Commissioner, <laughs> Mr. Jeffrey Orridge. I think that was former Commissioner, <laughs> but uh, but as, as we discussed, if you're a president once, then you're always referred to as a president. If you're a governor, then you're always referred to as a governor. I don't know if that applies to commissioner, but, just but you know, it. I've been called worse, just keep so it. that's okay. <laughs> I can live with this. So, so Colin, I got a fantastic story. I want uh, Mr. Commissioner to tell, uh, he's always going to be commissioner in my, my viewpoint. Um, but I, he has a very colorful, wonderful, inspired story. But I want to start this one off by him because it's that season telling about his experience with the dream team, the NBA's dream team. It's it's a fabulous story that I think will set the stage for this young, intelligent uh, uh, mountain mover. So do you mind, Mr. Commissioner, telling that story? <laughs> well, which one? There's so many stories. I, um, but no, I was really fortunate in, in 1991. Um, I was, uh, it, I think it just, the way the world has worked, the way the universe has worked, the way, um, my faith has worked. Um, I've been, I've been really blessed to be in the right place at the right time on so many different occasions. And, um, I am on my way to St. Louis to visit someone whom I had just met recently and I had never plan to go to St. Louis, but, uh, but I wanted to stay in touch with this person. So I'm waiting to get onto the plane and coming off of the plane is a gentleman by the name of Charlie Grantham, who was the executive director of the NBA Players Association. He gets off the plane and we had met each other in the past and had mutual friends. And he said, Jeffrey, I just thought about you a little while ago 
because I thought you'd be an excellent candidate to be general counsel of USA Basketball, which was actually um, called by a different name then, but it was the Amateur Basketball Association of America, which basically uh, sponsored um, uh, elite amateur competition, the Olympic Games, the Junior Olympics, and, and so on. And so, um, so I just, just by happenstance, he said, you know, I couldn't get in touch with you. I didn't have your contact information and there was no internet at the time. <laughs> so it wasn't, he, he couldn't just Google me or there was no LinkedIn. So, um, so it was just fortuitous and, uh, and we got in touch and I believe there were excess of 400 applicants for this job as general counsel. And, uh, and wow. the idea was that, uh, the plan was to form um, a, an NBA team to enter the Olympics for the first time because uh, the uh, governing body, international governing body for basketball, FIBA, had allowed professionals now, technically professionals, to, uh, to uh, represent their country. So this was the first time that NBA players could actually get involved. So, um, so I was hired in 1991. Um, at the inception of the formation of the dream team, we didn't even have all the players involved. Uh, I believe, um, Magic Johnson was the first person who raised their, raised his hand and said, you know, I'm in. And then he called his buddy, Larry Bird and, uh, then Michael Jordan. And then it went down the line and, and, you know, when you have that, uh, core group of players, then, then it really becomes an honor. But, you know, it was met with a lot of, um, complexity. Because if you recall back then, these were the marquee players. These were the franchise players for each one of their teams. And, uh, and the revenue that they generated for these, these teams was astronomical. So if anything should happen to these players, if the franchise player would go down, there'd be significant financial risk um, to these franchises. So we had to work through that. And then, of course, um, each player had their own shoe contract, um, whether it was Converse or Fila or um, Nike or L.A. Gear. So uh, it wasn't just and, like getting like, a, hey, let's just do a quick pickup game or something like that. It wasn't. It, no, it, it actually was a little more complicated than that. <laughs> um, and so hence they needed a general counsel and, and director of legal and business affairs. So uh, so. Fast forward, I was hired um, out of a significant pool of, uh, of applicants, and I moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado from New York City. Also, the other funny story is I was a city boy, um, or at least I fashioned myself to be because I really didn't have a whole lot of experience outside of, of New York, or I had gone to uh, rural Western Massachusetts Amherst College, but that was just four years. And so I moved back to the city and uh and this was in colorado springs colorado and at the time they uh they still had cows um that were literally um in the downtown area um and a railroad time. system and i was not familiar with rail railroads other than what i saw in the movie i was familiar with the subway in new york city but not a railroad <laughs> so um so it was a cultural uh, a cultural adjustment that i had to make but, uh, but obviously um, that kind of launched the beginning of, uh, of my sports career, sports, sports uh, marketing and, um, and, and sports law and uh, sports and entertainment and everything that, that, uh, that rolled from there. So this all happened because of a chance crossing at an airport. Yes, I, I don't think that I would, one, I would not have been aware of the opportunity. Um, two, I wouldn't have uh, known that there was an access point to the opportunity. Oh. I mean, Charles Grantham basically, you know, uh, ushered me in as an applicant um, to put my resume into the mix. Um, I was fortunate to have been one of several selected to fly out and interview uh, with, with uh, the folks at, at USA Basketball. Um, and then I got the job. So, and the rest, as they say, is history. But that was really what launched me into uh, a career in sport. And that that career took you to many different places and many different avenues. And you took that 
launch pad and you went on to work again with the Olympics. Is that, was that the next step or what was the next step for you? Yeah. So this was 1991. And then ultimately, you know, we were responsible for all elite uh, basketball competition. So it was everything from elite high school uh, through um, the Olympics. Um, so that was the formation of the first dream team in 1992. Um, in 1994, uh, I, uh, I elected to take a job with, with Reebok International, and I came in as counsel for worldwide marketing and advertising and then quickly transitioned to director of global sports marketing, um, putting deals together uh, for all the elite athletes and, uh, and major sports properties, everything from working on deals with the NBA to the Atlanta Olympics, um, and taking over the Shaquille O'Neal, uh, business, um, enterprise for, for, for Reebok. Um, and then a couple of years after that, I was recruited to work for Warner brothers to build a sports brand. So I moved out to Los Angeles in the middle of, uh, February, um, that was my first interview. I was in Stoughton, Massachusetts, uh, with about three feet of snow. And then I get flown out to Los Angeles on the, uh, on a lot of Warner brothers. And they took me to the commissary, um, to have lunch. And I think, uh, Mel Gibson was shooting a movie there at the time. Holly Berry was there. Um, George Clooney, um, and it's 80 degrees in, uh, Fahrenheit and sunshine. Uh, and I asked them, how much do I need to pay you to take this job? And so, um, so I built a sports brand for, for Warner Brothers called WB Sport and moved on from there. Um, so my, my experience has been everything from sports marketing and licensing um, to, uh, to athlete management and uh, in relationship building. And, uh, and, and then going over to Momentum Worldwide and getting really immersed in, in, uh, in marketing for major clients uh, like Coca-Cola, uh, Delta Airlines, and helping them out uh, formulate uh, marketing strategies. And, uh, you know, and, and then the internet came, uh, and uh, at the time it was called uh, dot .com. Um, and had, had things worked out, it was the C, the chief marketing officer of one, and then became a CEO of another, all that within the space of a year, because that's how rapidly things changed back then in 1999, 2000. Um, but had things worked out a little differently, I probably would have still been having this conversation with you, but I certainly would have been having it probably from my own private island in the South Pacific somewhere. <laughs> and we would have had to have gotten in touch through my Swiss banker. <laughs> but, uh, but the internet bubble burst and it didn't happen. And then I moved back to Los Angeles and, uh, and took a job with Mattel uh, okay. and built a worldwide consumer products division for the boys and entertainment um, departments at, at Mattel. And, uh, and, you know, and and then just kept going from there. So I had a consumer products background uh, at that point and just, just continued to try to keep learning uh, about different aspects and areas of, of all types of businesses. Um, and I think I, I really leveraged my, uh, my first career opportunity, um, which was um, doing mergers and acquisitions and leverage buyouts and revolving credit facilities right out of law school. Because when you go to Harvard Law School, you are literally <clears throat> tracked um, to do that type of corporate work. And I certainly had a significant amount of, of student loans that I had to repay. So I, I went for the most lucrative opportunity and also the opportunity to learn, you yeah. know, quite frankly, and to get those credentials. Because everything, um, especially back then, was about credentials, accreditation, qualifications, um, and calling cards, you know, who was going to take my call. And I knew that uh, it would be a lot more likely for me to have access to opportunities, um, having gone to Harvard Law School and then having gone to work for a firm like Rogers and Wells that, uh, that had significant credibility in, in, um, in the upper echelon of, of transactional corporate law. And so, you know, one thing builds on another, and uh, and I think that's that's how it happened. So, yes, the coincidence was running into Charles Grantham, who was extraordinarily gracious and to whom I owe an incredible debt um, and gratitude. 
uh, but I think it's also a matter of having been prepared uh, to take advantage of the opportunity as well. I told you it was impressive, Colin. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's, it's funny. So, so you went from cold to warm to cold again. How did you come up to Canada, man? Like, I mean, was it conditioning so, um, or what? Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm cold already. I'll go. I'll right, go exactly. So, so I had moved uh, <clears throat> to Toronto from Los Angeles to take a position with Right to Play, which is a global humanitarian organization. My wife and I had been talking about um, about careers. Um, she was very comfortable. She's uh, a very accomplished um, professional in her own right, having uh, been a marketing executive for Mattel and, and Warner Brothers at different times. And she was in sports as well, uh, sports licensing and, and, and home entertainment, and very comfortable there. I felt I needed to um, satisfy uh, my spirit. I, I really felt uh, compelled to do something that was on purpose for purpose. And, uh, and instead of taking a job uh, back in the entertainment industry, which there were, um, I was being recruited for several at the time. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, a search firm called me and through uh, a series of conversations, uh, let me know about an opportunity in Toronto uh, with Right to Play, and they worked in 26 countries around the world and some of the most um, impoverished uh, areas of the world where the Human Development Index was so abysmally low that there were places that didn't even have running water. And what we tried to do was bring learning modules for numeracy and literacy and health and hygiene and conflict resolutions, um, training coaches, um, uh, within those territories, in those communities, um, and working with kids anywhere from, you know, primarily four to to, to fourteen years old, or six to sixteen okay. years old, and and just you know providing them with with three things really: it's uh, something to do, something to love, and something to look forward to. Um, and with those those aspects, um, you know, as a highly successful organization. It was located, uh, the uh, headquarters was in Toronto, founded by Johan Olive Koss, who's a former Olympian. And, uh, and I got hired um, and as the chief operating officer responsible for the operations globally. And then I took on the role subsequent to that as head of uh, global business development for them, uh, working in uh, developed countries uh, with donors and and supporters, financial supporters of Right to Play. So it was great. Um, I had had every intention of moving, honestly, moving back down to the United States after, you know, three or four years up here, giving back. And then I had the opportunity to, uh, to become the head of uh, CBC Sports and responsible for Hockey Night in Canada and, uh, and revamping our positioning in terms of the sports uh, genre and focus on on amateur sports and the Olympics. So I was responsible for uh, negotiating several years of, of Olympic wow. deals for for CBC. Je Jeffrey, what year was that? <clears throat> what years were those? Three? So um, 2011 to 2015, okay. I was with CBC. Right. Uh, okay. And then, um, then was appointed... Um, Commissioner of the the CFL in 2015. Okay. If you're kicking, if we can just go back, I just want to talk a little bit more about right to play, and, and not so much the context of the work, but the context of you know both Cavis and I get a lot of opportunity to talk to to young and up and coming leaders <laughs> or uh, folks who aspire to leadership, and um, people will come to it from a lot of different directions. They 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 get into a, a track. Um, in, in business or, or in governments. And um, they spend the first part of their life really focusing on building their career. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then um, I've encouraged folks to always have something that, that inspires their heart. And, uh, and so you've just, you know, without even prompting, you, 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 you talked about that right away. There's something that you needed to do, you know, on purpose for purpose. And, and um, what, 
what things came to mind? What caused you to decide? Was that always in, inside of you? Was that something that was buried there for a long time? Or is that something you just woke up and said, you know, I need to do something different? Or how did that You play? know, I, I think it was a combination. Um, I had, you know, I guess what you would call an epiphany. My, uh, my eldest son, who's now 18, was two at the time. But uh, probably pretty soon after he was born, I was thinking, you know what? I've had really cool jobs. And I've been always one of the favorite uncles. You know, when you work for a shoe company like Reebok or <laughs> you work for a toy company like Mattel, you become really popular around Christmas time uh -huh. um, as a favorite <laughs> uncle. But I also wanted my children, my family, to be proud of what I did for a living, not just be pleased with what I might be doing for a living. And so I think that's probably one of the things that inspired me. But I grew up in an environment, my, um, my family, my, my, my mother was a, a psychiatric nurse and then a social worker. Uh, my sister uh, ran the North American Child Adoption Agency for a while and, and, and uh, has advanced degrees in, in social work. Um, and my brother-in-law, taught at Columbia uh, in master's uh, degrees for, for, for social, social impact. Um, my family had been involved in politics. Uh, my uncle, uh, Basil Patterson, was Secretary of State of New York and Deputy Mayor and, and uh, had always been in, in, in that uh, realm. And then his, subsequently his son, David Patterson, became governor uh, of the state of New York as well. Um, my father's sister was a, was a nurse. Um, so public I service came from deep. a family yeah. of, uh, of public servants and, and caregivers. Yeah. And so what was always instilled in us, and I remember my father telling me, um, quoting from Muhammad Ali periodically, and one of the things that has always stayed with me is Muhammad Ali said that service to others is the rent we pay for our room on this earth. And that always stuck with me. And so I always felt as though I never wanted to be in arrears. And at some point, um, I had to do something very, very deliberate and very intentional. So it was probably a combination of always and, and you know, throughout my life, I was always, I was always mentoring and coaching and, and, and working with kids and coaching basketball um, with, with youth, sometimes, you know, in, in inner city uh environments um coaching track as well and uh that's always been a part of of my family's culture so i think that was in, embedded in me uh, and then i had the opportunity to do that so i was compelled to do that my spirit moved me and even what i'm doing now um as uh, as ceo of uh tvo media Ed education group um as much as we are a multimedia um, platform that delivers the highest quality content, I mean, essentially we've been referred to as the PBS of the North. As much as we are all that, um, we are also, I think more importantly, a social impact organization. And one of the key poverty reduction strategies uh, for years now has been uh, focused on education. And I know that having this role with this team of people in place, the things that we do, while we are able to inspire learning, that has the opportunity to change the trajectory of somebody's life through education, whether it's formal education or alternative education, but catalyzing people's um, ideas, stimulating conversation, exposing folks to things that they may not have uh, otherwise thought about before and broadening their perspective um, certainly advances, uh, advances communities, enriches communities, and advances individuals. Cavis, this sounds like he's talking about a calling or something. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> no, far from it's it. It's just like... Far from Man, it. Far from it. I, no, 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 no. Let 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 me level set, guys. <laughs> um, this is not. You know, I I I I do I do have a certain um, spirituality, a, a, a faith, 
um, that I that I often call upon to to help guide me in my decision making. Um, but um, but it is not it is not anything that I have been um, you know particularly conscious about. Things have just evolved, mm -hmm. and and opportunities have just presented themselves. But in every job that I've had, even the most corporate of corporate jobs, um, there has always been an aspect that I've tried to carve out. Uh, whether it was directly related to my employment or on the side, where there was some aspect of giving back and and helping someone other than myself, seeing um, seeing outside of myself, and and I think in in many ways it's very selfish. Um, people think it as think of it as selfless, but the the joy that you feel, the peace that you feel, the elation that you feel. When you really feel like you're doing something for others, I think in a lot of ways, you know, that's in 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 a lot of ways that's selfish. It's selfish of me because I enjoy the feeling. And and to that end, Mr. Commissioner, we've seen in our generation the evolution of corporation and corporate leadership. It used to be corporate leadership in the simplest like form is about the bottom line profit share profit and taking care of it, the, the the shareholders now all of a sudden it's more of the stakeholders and having that social consciousness about it do you think and feel that uh, the shift or in terms of corporate uh, attitude and approach is helping our society or hurting our society for example we are living in a very volatile time in terms of social social aspects. Uh, we seem to be more divided than more together and more connected. It seems like some aspects of technologies have uh, given us too much information and made us go to our corners. How can we start to bring back that attitude and approach of uniting society and giving the next generation an opportunity to keep mended connectivity versus division wow well you know that's a really um a complex question that you've asked and there are a lot of different components to it i think uh i think covid um and the the reliance on technology that we've had in the last three years i mean it has just accelerated and advanced um how we communicate with each other but I think that level of lack of um, interpersonal um, interaction has uh, fomented a uh, more of a, a of a disconnect. Um, I, I think it's a lot easier to uh, to um, dis be dismissive of someone or disrespectful of someone when you're behind a keyboard rather than face to face. I think that. Um, you know, technology, as much as it has uh, connected us or given us the opportunity to communicate without connection, communication is suboptimal. Without connection, communication is ho can be hollow. So I think that's I, I think we have to get back to um, face to face communication. I think we have to get back to being able to um, read people's gestures and nuances um, and relate to each other on a more human – in a more human dimension, more human dynamic than through um, technology. I think that's one aspect. I think the other thing you, asked, you, you mentioned in terms of technology, the proliferation of information. I think it's the proliferation of misinformation and disinformation, which is contributing to the polarization um, that, that we're experiencing these days. Um, the question of trust. What's a trusted right. source? Because there's so many sources out there now. Who do you believe? Um, and I think, you know, I, I think what has happened very rapidly, and this was before COVID, I experienced it as commissioner of the, the CFL, is that people stopped separating fact from opinion. And journalism became confused with opinion writing and editorials. 
And, uh, you know, when I was growing up, two plus two equaled four, and it still should equal four. But a lot of times people say, no, 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 regardless of two plus two, it's not what you think it is. And let me give you an alternative interpretation of the math. So I, I think that's, that's uh, something else that we're suffering from. And so people um, have a tendency to um, go to sometimes the lowest common denominator or the worst possible uh, explanation. Um, and I don't know what it is, but I, I think it's similar to the psychology of people slow down for a train wreck. And, and people are more apt, the media has, and, and uh, the commercial media has recognized that uh, the more controversial a subject, the more inflammatory a subject, the more opportunity there is to attract attention and eyeballs. And eyeballs, viewership sells. So you want to commercialize tragedy. And I think that's the other thing that's been happening. So the more hyperbolic you make of a situation, the more exacerbating, uh, you know, catastrophic um headlines uh the more you're going to get readership and and i think that's and 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 a lot of that is is misdirected and it's misinformation and disinformation and and it is not for the good and i i want to take up on that because misinformation and disinformation is a multi-billion dollar industry and and now all of a sudden two plus two is five and we're trying to convince me that, and it goes back to uh, Star Trek, the next generation, where the Borg was trying to convince Captain Picard, <laughs> and he was in that. All he had to do was admit that, and they would let him go. But we're being held captive by inflammatory misinformation, salaciousness, because it's a multi billion dollar industry. But as a leader of a corporation, how do you protect your team? and build your team for connectivity versus that go to your corner and it's about you. How do you try to take away the selfishness to create team? Yeah, that, that, that's a really good, um, that's a really good question. I think, I think leaders are, um, leaders are developed through purpose. And if you, are um, perceived as someone who inspires others to join you with a purpose, if your vision is clear and compelling, if you, um, if, if you are focused on something that is larger than yourself and other people trust that, and they believe that they want to join you in that vision of things that are more important than just um, than just me, me, me. Then I think that's where leadership comes from. That that's where you, that's it's not about people following you. It's about people joining you. Um, so I, I I think I've been fortunate that. I've been associated with um, helping to create, construct, visualize um, a goal, an objective, a purpose um, that, uh, that was compelling enough. I think the other thing um, is you've got to create a culture um, of honest expectations, but the culture should be one of collaboration and teamwork. And it's easy when you're when you're part of the sports culture, because people get that. And it's easy that when you have employees that have been part of a team, not necessarily an individual sport, although that helps, but being part of a team sport, they understand sacrifice. They understand roles. They understand how their role and how their job um, relates to other people's roles and jobs um, so that you are able to achieve the mission. Right. Everybody wants to achieve success in whatever they're involved in. And how does my 
job play into that overall success? And I think if you're able to communicate that to people, um, people feel valued and they feel valuable uh, because they're contributing to something. Um, I think one of the things that you, you know, as a leader, you have to set an example. You got to have a positive attitude. Um, you have to, you have to um, be a learner. All leaders have to be learners, right? From experiences and constantly growing and constantly learning and listening more than you're talking for the most part. I know that I'm de clearly not demonstrating that in this conversation, but, but you know, I used to be a corporate lawyer, so I got paid by the word. That's why I'm so loquacious. But, um, but no, but I, I think being a good listener means being a good learner. Humility is really important. Um, don't act like you know everything because you don't. And if you act like you do, you will be exposed really quickly and that will diminish your credibility and that 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 erodes your you know the perception of your integrity and i think at the end of the day leaders have to be trusted people have to trust you and i think you know one of the first things you said in this in this lead up cavis is that um there's been an erosion of trust um in 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 society lately right like what's the trusted source i don't know who i can trust because I don't know, you know, if you are going to do what you say you're going to do. I don't know if you're going to honor your commitment. I don't know what that level of believability will be in you because I don't know you, right? And I may know you through a screen, but I haven't sat down and, and I didn't shake your hand. I didn't, I wasn't able to look you in the eye. I wasn't able to develop that type of rapport that I've been used to before. You know, we may not agree on everything, but at least I'm connected with you in some way, shape or form. So I'm more apt to listen and to understand your perspective. And I think that's, you know, that that is you asked how we get back to that. I think more people have to start embracing that. And I think more people have to take leadership roles. You don't have to lead from 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 the front. Uh, of uh, of the uh, of the room all the time, right? Leaders are everywhere within that room, right? It's not about a title, it's not about a, a, a level of compensation to be a leader. It's about taking the onus to own up to your failures and your successes, to give credit to people when they've done a good job, share the cookies as they say. Right. But to also own your failures. And the last thing I'm going to say about leadership is, OK, so I'm a CEO. I've been a CEO in a couple different um, in a couple different jobs in, in my career. Um, the C I've learned. You got to deal with controversy. You got to deal with conflict. And above all, you got to be able to manage criticism because no matter what you do as a leader, you will always be criticized. Somebody is always going to criticize you. So you got to be prepared to buckle that emotional seatbelt, that physical seatbelt sometimes, that mental seatbelt and that spiritual seatbelt if you really want to lead, right? And because being a leader, you got to make tough decisions. You got to be decisive. And, uh, and you're not always going to please people. And, and this is not a popularity contest. This is about um, optimizing your resources. It's about uh, making sure that people feel safe and protected um, and secure with you and the direction that you're moving. And not everybody's going to feel that way all the time. I I'm loving this, Kay. Because uh, th this this is a master class that that was the intent, Jeffrey. You you had asked me. Um, uh, no, I got to call you commissioner. Sorry, <laughs> and, and I'm supposed to bow and curtsy. Uh, Kikavis has been giving me the signal. No, time. no, no, no. That's, that, that that only applies to my two young sons. That's, no. <laughs> but you you had asked me um, just before we just before we started recording, um, like how, how did you guys start this up? Right. And, and there was the how. And I started to explain the how it happened. 
But what I didn't get to tell you was why we're doing this. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you're, you're, you're hitting all the nails on the head here on it is, is really, um, you know, the big passion behind this particular podcast is, is, um, is really developing, is educating, educating those, education of development, education development of leaders. And, you know, it could be a, a very well seasoned leader or maybe somebody who's on that path and, and they're hitting their head against the wall and wondering, can I do this? Should I do this? Am I too scared to, to step out and be that leader? And we've had several conversations, Kavis and I and, and other guests we've, where we've talked about, you know, the, the fear that happens for people to step up into these roles because they're going to get hit with a tomato. <laughs> or, it takes courage. Yeah. It definitely takes courage. So, but it can be done and they can do it, but they, but the encouragement, the inspiration, but most importantly, the guidance through this. And so this kind of conversation, uh, is, it dives right into the meat and potatoes, um, and, and everything from what, you know, talk, talking about the things that in terms of purpose, uh, that, that you've touched on, um, is a, is a, a massive driver. So I just, you know, I don't intend to come in here and make commentary all the time, but I, but I couldn't help myself. And, uh, so, so thank, uh, thank you for that. Um, Kibbs, we're not ready yet for the big question. No, person, no. I'm, I'm just wondering what it's going to be. No, no, no. So I'm wondering I, what the answer I, is. So I'm going to, I'm going to save it. Yeah. I, I, I want to go down this pathway because for those who are listening and will be listening, they may think uh, commissioner Orridge started, uh, on third base. They don't see the fact that he hit a single, he had to steal second, and he got bunted over to third. They don't see that. So I, I want to go back a little bit and talk about, because he wasn't born on third. He he didn't hit a triple. He had to work his way to home, home plate. Talk to me about getting to Harvard, getting out of... Uh, dealing with challenges and for all the young people that are listening and uh, aspiring and feel sometimes that they take four steps forward and they get kicked back 10 steps. Talk to us about that upbringing of dealing with controversy, dealing with adversity and making it to Harvard Law School and having corporate C executive position and what motivated you during that time and what kept you on the path to being Jeffrey Orridge? Um, you know, it, look, being Jeffrey Orridge started with being the son of, of Egbert and Jacinth Orridge, you know, and, and I say that, you know, I say that literally and, and figuratively, um, I was really blessed to have had parents who placed a premium on education, um, who made a lot of their sacrifices to send me to, you know, I tested pretty well. Um, so I was eligible to, to go to a, a really elite private school in, in grade eight. Um, and I had, you know, it was a really elite private school um, and uh, very academically rigorous, but it was the support of my parents. Um, even though I was on partial scholarship, um, they had to make financial sacrifices there. I remember, um, that there were, we were, we were raised Roman Catholic and my mother was a devout Catholic. And I remember at the time, uh, you wouldn't eat meat on, on Fridays, right? You usually had fish. And so there were, there were meatless Fridays. And those meatless Fridays sometimes became meatless Mondays as well. And, uh, and a lot of times it was no fish either. And I realized that my parents, you know, later on, I realized that my parents were just cutting back on the things that they needed to cut back on. And, and they weren't going on as many vacations and they were doing some things differently. Um, and that was to afford my opportunity to go to collegiate school for boys in Manhattan. And I had to take a bus and three trains to get there. I'd have to leave my house before seven in the morning um, to get there by 8.30 when classes started. 
And then I always played a sport. In, in the fall, it was football. In the winter, it was basketball. In the summer, it was baseball and until I switched to track in my junior year. But it was always after school varsity sports. And so you'd begin at 3.30 in the afternoon after class. You'd end around 6 p.m. I'd get home at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, eat dinner, and two, two and a half hours, three hours of, of homework every night. Um, and rinse and repeat. Um, but I could not have done that without the support of my parents um, and recognizing that they were making sacrifices. So part of what was compelling me was the fact that they were making the investment and they needed to get a return on their investment. I knew that then. <laughs> um, so, you know, so that was the compelling. So it wasn't about, I don't want to do this anymore. There were plenty of times when I wanted to quit. There were plenty of times when I felt like, I'm not up to, to this academic rigor, or I don't feel comfortable in this environment. I was one of two or three black kids in my class in a very wealthy environment. I mean, my classmates at collegiate were people like John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, and so I'm just giving you kind of a framework of the people that he was in my class, right? And there were a number of people like that, of, of that ilk and celebrity and, and wealth. And I did not come from that. I was born in East Elmhurst, New York. Um, and, uh, and making that trek into Manhattan every day. So aside from that, you know, but it positioned me to, to get into a, a, a very um, selective school like Amherst College. And I had a choice of Ivies or, or Amherst, and I chose Amherst um, and then matriculated from Amherst. And that was kind of the, the, the path to, to Harvard Law. But I didn't get into Harvard Law School the first time I applied. So I was waitlisted. So and, you know, when you and, and, and there were other people in my class um, who did get in and I felt excluded and I felt embarrassed. And there was an element of, of I wasn't good enough. That's why I didn't get in because I'm just not good enough. Um, and then ultimately, um, I did get in. So I think you know the lesson I had learned lessons all along. But one of them was just how do you deal with disappointment? How do you deal with what you perceive of as failure? Not as a I wasn't mature enough at the time to think. Well, this is just a lesson learned. This is this is going to, you know, um, f to to bolster my resilience in life and and my ability to to deal with disappointment. I didn't think that at all. I was crushed. Right. So um, I felt like I failed. So ultimately, I got my head around the fact that this just wasn't for you at this time. And there are seasons for everything. And timing is everything. And your path may be different from other people's paths. So, um, so yeah, so I dealt with that adversity. And then I felt when I got into Harvard Law, I said, okay, I'm set for the rest of my life. I am at Harvard Law School. I'm going to get out of Harvard Law School. And it wasn't that easy because, you know, they say look to the left of you, look to the right of you. Next semester, one of you may not be here, Right. So that was another demanding, challenging environment. So you're never really there. And then when you get out of Harvard Law School, you go to a firm, a large corporate firm that has really high expectations um, because, yeah, you want the money and you want the prestige and you want the privilege. But what are we willing to sacrifice for it? 60 hours a week, sometimes 70 hour work weeks. There are no vacations sometimes. There are no holidays sometimes. There are no weekends sometimes. You know, you have to work through it because of that environment. So there are trade-offs to everything. And after you go through that, being in a boardroom and being, you know, a, an, in an exalted position um, in a corporation and being the only person of color and not necessarily feeling like you are included or embraced. And there are times when you feel like you have been um, deliberately marginalized in terms of your opinion and your contribution and excluded from other conversations 
that are that are decision making or or influential and feeling devalued and not knowing you know is it them or is it me what am i doing wrong you know how much harder do i have to work just to be viewed as even not equal just even how much more do i have to give how much more how much more do I have to be superior to the environment in order to be recognized? So you go through that. So, you know, there are a lot of internal conflicts that you have to to manage as well as the external conflicts. But all that, you know, once again, when we talk about elements of leadership, it's resilience. It's being able to have that intestinal fortitude. And I don't I wasn't born with it. Right. I, it had to be forged. It had to be molded. It had to be through, you know, through a lot of trials and tribulations. Um, and and I remember um, there was a, a, a I think a psychologist. His name was Rollo May uh, in the States. And he said, you know, he talked about um, courage. Right. And he said. And to be a leader, you got to be – you have to step out there sometimes, right? And you have to subject yourself to to things that are uncomfortable. But he said the, the opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice. The opposite of courage is conformity. So sometimes you have to do things a little bit differently, right? And you have to, you have to subject yourself to ridicule, to criticism, to marginalization. Because sometimes you just are different. You just – I mean I walk into a boardroom and I am ostensibly different in most of the environments I've ever been in. I don't look like everybody else. I don't sound like everybody else. I'm not – my lived experience is very different from other people that I'm generally interacting with. And now the conversation is about embracing those differences. But this is a fairly new conversation, gentlemen. This is a fairly new conversation where people are recognizing um, aspects of the business rationale for inclusivity. The fact that that you know McKinsey has done several white papers on on a more diverse um, work environment leads to greater productivity and uh, and and greater accomplishment. So that's the business case for it. So at least they have married now structure with sentiment because the sentiment I think was there before, but people wanted to feel as though you could prove the business case behind why should I hire you as opposed to somebody else. So at least we're getting there. We're, we're having those conversations, but it wasn't always that way. And growing up in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s um, and the 2010s, um, uh, yesterday or the day before was the third anniversary of George Floyd when there was an international recognition that there was rampant social injustice, right? I've been dealing with social injustice most of my life just by dent of where I was born and and the parents that I had and where they were born. But it, you know, I think the bottom line is for younger people, do not be deterred. Do not give up. Own your failure too. You know, it's it, it, sometimes you go through an imposter syndrome. Am I good enough? Because maybe I didn't hit it out of the park the first time, or I didn't get a hundred percent, or I only scored fifty percent of my goal. That's okay because it's not about focusing on the failure. It's about focusing on the lesson learned from the failure and taking ownership. Of, of, of whatever the result is and just moving forward. But that's leadership, taking ownership, being accountable. You know, a lot of people want to, want to, you know, um, not, not take responsibility, right? And put it on somebody else or make excuses. Well, I'm a victim, right? I, I'm suffering from injustice. I, I it's because of my circumstances or my conditions. It's not about the decisions that I made. It's about my circumstances. And I think if you take ownership of your decisions based on your circumstances, then you feel better about yourself. 
then you are now in control. And when you feel you're in control, then you're in, then you're in a leadership position. I tell the, 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 the eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds that I coach in basketball sometimes, I say control the ball, you control the game. You control the game, you win the game. And I, I got one uh, final follow-up because Colin touched on and you elaborated on it. I think uh, one of our previous guests who is in the political realm uh, talked about uh, the state of something happened in the U.S. And both of us have that American background. And I look down with embarrassment, uh, to be quite frank, with embarrassment that normal is actually abnormal in U.S. political leadership right now. And it is probably a deterrent for a lot of people to enter. And the question she posed was, are those the best leaders you have an opportunity to present before the public? And I remember growing up as a proud American of seeing the pool of people that could possibly be being inspired and encouraged by them. Now all of a sudden you're discouraged and you don't even want to hear it. I don't call that leadership. So I was uh, upon reflection when she said, are those the best leaders? No, they're not leaders. There are propagandists that are capitalizing on the weak and the undereducated. And when we allow misinformation, disinformation to sell in media and other outlets and make that the normal, and they're not the majority, they're just the most uh, profitable. And let's call a spade a spade, they're the most profitable. We need to find ways of bringing back truth, integrity, and honesty in leadership and allowing not money to dictate leadership, but the purpose of growing our culture and society. That's the erosion that we're feeling. People keep saying other countries are taking over. Great civilizations don't die or are not defeated. They're, they commit suicide. And right before our eyes, we can see that because of the leadership we have is really eroding the fabric of what was a foundation of a very, very, very powerful society. So I just wanted that commentary because you touched on it. We need to be more bold to call out poor leadership. And right now we don't have it. And we're discouraging a generation from entering into that social political leadership realm because they know that that's not truth. They know that's not leadership. And we're allowing it to happen and we're allowing it to be propagated because of profits. Well, yeah, that's a really good point. But I also think that – and I also think that um, there is a feeling of – I wouldn't call it apathy, but but you know, younger generations feel disenfranchised. And they feel disenfranchised from the system because, one, there's more awareness of the way the system works and the fact that it, it can be exclusionary uh, by design. I think um, the other thing that happens is when you feel as though there is an absence of hope, you don't get involved. You figure, well, why bother? Because insight without action leads to cynicism. And when people are aware that there are things that are wrong and they're not being fixed, that's when people feel like – what can I do? And, you, and, and, and you, you become disengaged and you don't want to enter into the process because, because an element of hope has been extracted from it. And I also think that's by design though. I think there's a reason why um, – I mean there was all kinds of um, social activism in the 60s, whether it was civil rights or, or the Vietnam War. Or, um, or unions, right? People getting fair, the element of fairness, right? The element of, of equity. Um, those were themes that people rallied uh, around and, and, and treating other people with respect. Um, and, and I just, and I think, you know, that, that has eroded. And so when it gets, when we can come back to, leadership that that we can all be leaders 
are you humble? Right? Do you, do you do you understand a sense of humility? It's not all about me, me, me. It's about I'm honored and I'm fortunate to be in a situation where I can potentially make a difference and I'm going to work really hard to do that and I have to perform to do that. Um, do I have integrity? Do I have the respect of other people because I treat other people with respect? Do I have a balanced temperament? Right? Am I, do I have the ability to adapt and adjust to different kinds of people and different kinds of personalities? Um, relationships matter. We talked about that earlier. You know, am I, am I willing to invest in other people and forging those relationships um, and, and being aligned with people who can be influential um, and, and not be discouraged by the fact that, you know, that there are so many forces around that feel overwhelming at times that, that I, that, that it feels like it's too much for me to confront. Well, that's, that's where courage comes in, you know, and that's also where, um, where encouragement comes in because you can't do it by yourself. I mean, I was encouraged by my family. I was encouraged by my friends when I wanted to give up and there were plenty of times I wanted to quit, whether it was basketball or running track or, 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 in, or, you know, or in school, ah, it's too hard. I, 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 I'm not up to it. I'll take the easier path. Other people kind of said, no, you have an obligation. You have a responsibility to continue. And so, you know, I kind of knew that, right? And so sometimes you're inspired, but other times, you know, it's not just about inspiration. It's about motivation and other people have to help motivate you. Canis, I don't know what there's left to be said, man. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> I, I, I'm just loving this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing this back. I'm going to be driving, listening to this in the car all for the next few weeks until I pick up another diamond ring on the ground. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Jeffrey, well, I want to be uh, respectful of your time. And, and I, I really, I really appreciate the time you've given us today that you've shared with us today and, and, and your thoughts. And um, we, we have a, we have a question that we always, we, we've been asking every, everybody we've had on guests and, and uh, on this and, you know, I think we're going to build a word cloud or something out of this. Um, and it, to me, it's probably the most fascinating question or the response is the most fascinating for, of all the questions that we ask. But if, if Cavus and I had the opportunity to build a prototype leader, blank slate, um, we're going to be in the lab, um, with our, with our white coats on and, uh, test tubes <laughs> and bubbling. safety glasses. Yeah. Test tubes bubbling. And, um, uh, and, and we're going to build a leader and we were to come to you and say, listen, um, we only have one opportunity here. We only have one characteristic that we can put into this because that's the limits that we have right now, whether it be a, uh, an attribute, a characteristic, um, uh, if there was one thing that you said, this leader must have, they must have this or the rest of it fails. For Jeffrey, what would that be? Only one. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? So I can't, so like this, this new AI program that you're developing, because yeah. you know that's coming. You know that's what, they're going to put a number of different elements. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And then they yeah. come, they're going to come out with the quintessential Okay, okay. Leader. You know that, right? I, I'm going to hold you to one, although I'll be, I will be honest. I don't think we've had anybody that's stuck to the stuck to the rules here. Like they've they've all broken the rules. We've been asking for one, and then they'll say one, but they pile a whole like six or seven underneath right. it. Right? They're like one A <laughs> and one B. Okay. All right. So 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 let me try to do this. Okay. Leadership is about accountability. It's about accountability. You need to be accountable to yourself. You need to be accountable to other people. You need to own it. 
Okay, whatever it is, whatever it is, you need to own it. You need to to be accountable to when it's when it's about performing, because you do have to perform. You do have to be humble. You do have to treat other people with respect. You do have to um, inspire people um, to, to inspire them to trust you, right? They do all of those things. If you if, if you are accountable and you have owner and you take ownership over those things, that's what comes back to you, right? And that's what inspires people to join you, because without people joining you, you you can't lead anything. You're not leading anything. So he smartly used one tent, but threw four things in there. <laughs> The man's a lawyer. <laughs> Only four? <laughs> Cavus, you haven't been keeping up. I listed more than four. The man with the Come Harvard on. Law School. Of course he's going to be able to pack this in nice. Come no, I, I, I love it. No, Je Jeffrey, this this is great. Like, um, I, I've been amazed at the responses that, that we've had um, from people. And, and we've had really neat opportunities from business leaders to, to new entrepreneurs, very young entrepreneurs. Um, to uh, senators and former cabinet ministers who are now out of the business and leading elsewhere. And, um, you know, I've just been fascinated with, with the, the range of responses, but also the focus from each one. That, and and it's, it's very, very clear. Um, you know, Kavis, I may have to spend a lot of time in the, in the lab to get the AI program to work just right. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, but it's very clear to me that um, uh, from everything that you covered today, and I made a, I made a lot of notes. Uh, I'm glad we've got this record. I made a lot of notes here um, that uh, owning it, the accountability you've talked about is, is, is consistent through everything that you've, that you've talked about today. So um, no surprise. Um, so, so, um, so I thank you. Kavis, is anything you want to close yeah. off for? I just have to say, uh, there's a saying down south, give people their flowers while they're living versus putting it on their grave. And I was privileged and honored to be under Jeffrey's leadership and what he talked about, he lived. And uh, he is uh, a model. Uh, he epitomizes what he said and you can watch him and he not say a word and you'll be inspired by him. And in a very short period of time, too short in my opinion, uh, I really felt that he brought an energy to the CFL. He brought hope, he brought a clarity. And I saw that being in the mix. I saw his vision and he was trying to teach and inspire people. And he was not one to beat his chest and was humble and didn't want to be a commissioner, but a partner in this effort to get something right. So while he's present and for all those listening, I can personally give testimony that this man has lived what he's spoken and it's nothing superficial or artificial about him. That's the authentic Jeff, Jeffrey Orridge. Uh, thank you. Mr. Reed, um, that was, uh, your comments were super generous, very, very kind, but, but really very, very generous. And I, and I appreciate that. Um, I hope that I will continue to, um, to do the things that I say, I, I, I believe in, um, and, and so far I've been fortunate, um, both professionally and personally to be given the opportunity, um, to you know to live a certain value system and and i do believe that's a blessing because not everybody has that opportunity jeff would you ever do this again with us <laughs> <laughs> we may have to come to your shop and sit there and <laughs> this was honestly this this is this was deep i think people anyone listening to this is going to just they're, they're going to just derive so much they're going to take so much from this so um you know, this, this conversation was very, very valuable. And I, I, you know, I appreciate you opening up and, and being vulnerable with us and, and, um, you know, and listen to our silly stories about picking up, picking up rocks. 
Anytime. Anytime. I, I love silly stories. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in, in, in all honesty, um, any time, gentlemen, I'd, I'd be happy to join you again, um, whether it's at this forum or any other. I really appreciate what you're doing. Stay bald, man. Well, thank you. Stay bald, bro. <laughs> all right. Take care. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Bald Leadership. If you enjoyed the show, please follow, like, and share. See you next time.